what have you noticed in regards to these financially successful people? What's the common belief that they all share amongst each other? Hey Insider, I'm back again with a very special episode featuring a success insider. His name is Patrick Bet David, who's a successful startup entrepreneur, CEO of PHP Agency Inc., emerging author and the creator of Valuetainment on YouTube with almost half a million following. Now, if you're somebody who is looking to get into business, maybe you want to become an entrepreneur, or maybe you already are an entrepreneur, but you want to learn the strategies that will make you more successful, well, you will find this episode particularly useful. In fact, the strategies we cover more towards the end of this interview, it gets more powerful, so be sure to stick all the way to end, and let me know on your thoughts in regards to this interview in the comments box below. Without further ado, enjoy this episode with Patrick Bet David. Thank you so much. So today, I want to basically dig uh, deep in regards to the psychology behind your success. But before we do that, we tend to uh, receive a lot of cliche questions here at Success Insider from some of our followers who are beginning their journey, such as, how do I become rich? How do I become a millionaire and so forth? And so let's just start with the surface layer questions like that. So if somebody turns to you, Patrick, and says, I want to become financially free, I want to earn, I don't know, seven figures, what do you normally turn around and say to them? So I did a video on that. I did a video on that about how to become a millionaire. I think the biggest thing about uh, uh, seven figures, you know, you if so if your formula for what the value you bring is a seven figure formula, you'll make that money. It's not going to happen if you don't have that uh, value part. A lot of times we all start off and uh, we get into a, uh, a job or a career and we start working in a place and we realize our value is $50,000, our value is $40,000, our value is $80,000. The fastest way to make seven figures is you got to be in sales. That's number one. The fastest way. If you're not in sales, you're going to take the slow route. I just met with somebody right now um, who sold uh, his insurance practice for a good $20 million check and he started off by selling first and then from there, uh, he went and sold an insurance practice. Now it's technology. Now it's other things that he's doing. But the fastest way, uh, it's sale. The slow way is corporate, move up, go become an executive. One day you become a CFO, a CEO, or some kind of a position like that with a big corporation. You make seven figures. That could take you 20 to 30 years. But the fastest is sales. Once you get into sales, you as an individual to make a million as an individual salesperson, you have to have a high ticket item product to sell. So that's First thing, if you don't have a high ticket item product to sell, for instance, I met a guy that sells Boeing planes. Boeing plants. That's a high ticket item. Boeing, like Boeing, you know, the big uh, uh, planes that Southwest Airlines and these. Oh, right. Uh, yes. American Airlines are Boeing, right? The, the 747, the 737s. Mm -hmm. That's a high ticket item. You sell a ticket item like that that's, you know, a $200 million, $100 million, $300 million, some even a billion dollars you're gonna get a million dollar check on that, but that's a niche market, right? You're dealing in a very small niche uh, market. If you go become a sports agent, you can make seven figures. So if you don't work in a high ticket item, you're dealing on a low ticket item. I'm selling t-shirts, I'm selling insurance, I'm selling books, I'm selling paintings, I'm selling furniture, I'm selling whatever. Now you're talking volume. So for volume, you need leverage. Uh, for leverage, you need an army, you need a distribution, you need a uh, amount of people that are going out there that are helping you uh, market whatever that product is. Uh, and, and generally speaking, most people make their money, their millions in the one I just talked about, which is finding a way to leverage. You see a lot of people now they doing drop shipping and you can do drop shipping to make money because you have social media that's on your side. Uh, they can do that with, but it's not a lot of people making seven figures. It's the ones that actually know what they're doing. So if you, you can figure out a way to leverage your product mm -hmm. where you as an individual are in a hundred different places at one time, then you can put yourself in a position to make $83,000 a month, which in a, you know, you'll make your seven figure year income. Okay. What would you say if somebody turns around and says, I don't like selling, I'm bad at it. Then you better have a very uh, expensive skill set that you're good at. Uh, uh, coding. Um, you know, something behind the scenes where you're an analyst and you're a guy like a Billy Bean, um, who, uh, uh the guy that was hired by the Oakland A's. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the Billy Bean story. Uh, uh you ever watched the movie Moneyball with, uh, Brad Pitt? Uh, uh no, I didn't think so. No. Okay. So this is a very interesting story. And by the way, this is a great question you asked because typically when somebody says they don't like selling, 
they're typically shy, private, and somewhat of an analytical, technical mind, right? I mean, so they're coming from a place of, uh, I don't want to be around people too much. I kind of like behind the scenes. I don't need to get the credit. I don't need everybody to know my name. Um, but I still want to make seven figures. Okay. So this kid, 19-year-old kid, goes to Billy Bean and he puts a spreadsheet together. Mm -hmm. And he says, I think all these baseball teams who are buying players who are hitting home runs are wasting money. If you want to go and make it into the uh, – uh, uh, World Series, the most important data for us to measure is on base percentage. And so he would say, here's 200 people in the AAA right now that we need to go and look for and recruit. And the guy would say, this guy sucks. He says he sucks on the stats that you look at, but he's very good on on base percentage because he always makes it on base, right? Mm -hmm. So the guy, Billy Beans, believes this 19-year-old guy, they take the formula and they take their team to the next level. And then eventually that guy, Billy Beans, uh, the 19-year-old kid, gets a multi-multi-seven-figure-year contract, and Billy Bean gets a $21 million a year contract. So if you're a guy that's an analytical guy, find a place that you can go run reports and metrics on and say, this is what we need to solve. If you can solve the, I'm a billion-dollar company, you come to me and say, look what I found for you. If we focus on X, Y, Z, you'll be able to save yourself $63 million per year. And if I'm able to save you the $63 million per year, I want 10% of that. Are you open to that? Yes, that's $6 million. Um, so you got to be so smart on the analytical side where you can solve bigger problems that doesn't require sales. Okay. You mentioned earlier in regards to um, when somebody's not good at selling or they wouldn't really believe that they can sell, they may be lacking, I believe you said self-esteem or something on the lines of that. Now, have you always been somebody who, well, to me, you come across quite confident. Have you been somebody who's always been quite confident in regards to what you do? Or It's so funny you say that I was just in L.A. this past week for Christmas, and my dad was telling stories about how shy I was. As a kid, I would always hide behind my dad's legs because I was so shy. I didn't want to go and talk to people. Uh, one time, a, uh, a TV game, Donkey Kong, I don't know if you remember that game, uh, the Donkey Kong game, it was an orange uh, you would flip and you would play it. I'm 39. I don't know how old you are. You look like you're 24. You look like a young guy. <laughs> 26, <You're>, yeah. <laughs> 26. So yep. this Donkey Kong game was a, you would flip it and you would just play it. It was called TV game in Iran. Okay. And I wanted this thing so bad. But we go to the store and I would look at it and I would say, Dad, I, wanna, I want you to buy that for my birthday. And he would say, go talk to the sales guy. I said, I'm not going to talk to him. You go talk to him. So I'm not going to buy it unless you go talk to him. So I'm not going to go talk to him. I didn't talk to this guy for one year. That's how shy I was. So eventually one day I said, I'm ready to go talk to the guy. He says, okay, let's get in the car. We get in the car. We sit in the car for 30 minutes. Finally, I get it to get, I go outside, I talk to the guy. And then my dad starts talking and then he buys it for me for my birthday and I get it. The point is, it's either inspiration or it's desperation. So at that moment, I was inspired because I wanted this game. Let me give you the desperation story of sales for me. I'm living in Germany at a refugee camp. Uh, Khomeini dies, who was the, at that time, he was the leader of Iran. He dies June 3rd, 89. We escape six weeks later. We go to Germany. Uh, I'm a refugee living in Germany at a refugee camp. So the new Super Nintendo came out, okay, with Super Mario Brothers 2. And I had a girl who was living at the camp with me. Her name was Katarina. She was beautiful, Czechoslovakian girl, Czech Republic girl. And her brother, Jan Staff, who was four years older than me, he was fascinated with video games. And I was broke. I didn't have any money. My mother doesn't have any money. There's a reason why we're living at the refugee camp. So I said, I got to go buy the Super Nintendo because he needs to play with the Super Nintendo. I want to play with his sister. I want to spend some time with his sister. And so I go to a local swimming pool, this local swimming pool that they had in uh, Erlangen. Germans like to drink a lot of beer and there was beer bottles everywhere So I went to the owner of the swimming pool and I said look If I were to collect all these beer bottles for you and I clean this place up What will you give me per beer bottle? He said I'll give you five fennec fennec is like pennies. So I'll give you five Fennec per uh, bottle I said no problem. So I knew I needed 5,000 beer bottles because the Super Nintendo was 249 marks. I collected 5,000 beer bottles that summer I got my 250 marks. I went to the Kaufhof. I bought the Super Nintendo. I brought it back to the refugee camp. I was a cool guy in campus, and Jan would play Super Nintendo every day, and his sister was with me every day for a year and a half. 
So the one part is inspiration. The one part is desperation. So if somebody is not doing that well in life right now and they realize they need to make quarter million, a half million, a million dollars, two hundred thousand dollars, and they don't have a lot of options, you're either going to be inspired to do it for your family or you're going to be desperate. So you're going to go out there and put your ego on the line and go asking people to sell because you have to or else your kids are going to be uh, not being able to go to that private school and you saw something happen to your kid that you're not happy about. One of those two is generally going to end up happening. Okay. What would you say in regards to this? Do you think everyone could potentially earn a million in regards to, let's say, one year? One year, seven figures. Do you think that's possible for anybody? Or 100%. Uh, now, let me, let, let me take the one part out. So let's talk about disabilities. So yep. when you're saying everybody, I, I don't want to generalize and say, do you believe this disabled person that does this, 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 can they do this? Mm -hmm. uh, Ten years ago, I met a guy named Nick Vujicic, and Nick Vujicic was born without limbs. So he wrote a book, I think, called Life Without Limbs, something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and he literally doesn't have arms. He has no legs. And this guy ends up becoming one of the sought out speakers around the world today that I think he went and spoke to the Argentinian, Argentinian country. And at one of the sessions, he gave 65,000 people showed up. Uh, he's right now a six-figure speaker per speech he gives. So he's a disabled human being, and he's doing that. But I'm not putting disability on there. Mm -hmm. Let's go to the complete opposite side. Do I believe everybody can do it? Yes. Do I believe everybody needs to do it? No. Do I believe everybody is willing to do the work to get there? No. Do I believe everybody will do it? Absolutely not. Um, but there's got to be a real reason for somebody to want to go out there and make that money. If they don't find it, they're not going to do it. It's just simply what's going to come down to. And then the other side of it is the logical aspect of it is I am very surprised at how little people work around the world. Most people are not hard workers. Uh, most people cannot wait to come home and watch a certain show they're addicted to. Most people know more stats about their favorite sports player and sports team than they know about the next stock or Bitcoin or investments or real estate. Uh, most people can tell you more about a character in a movie or a TV show than they can tell you about Warren Buffett. Uh, most people have studied uh, uh, the, the, the guy, what's that one show, Breaking Bad on Netflix, and they can tell you everything about him, but they can't tell you everything about Jeff Bezos. You know, most people can sit there and tell you so much facts and data about nonsense things in life that tells you they have the ability to study and research. They have the ability to get obsessed about a TV show and a series or a sports team, but they can't have the ability to get a bit obsessed about business. I think they can. I just don't think they want to and they're not willing to do the work. So if it comes down to a position where somebody gets inspired, uh, yes, I believe anybody can go make seven figures. How do you think you could snap out of that pattern in regards to, let's say, being somebody who fits into that all of that mainstream media and so forth and go into the entrepreneur field or hustling, whatever? I mean, look, you really have to, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's, it's really, it really has to matter to you that much. I did a conference call last week mm -hmm. and, and I said, I said, listen, if something matters to you, I guarantee you it's going to be yours. If it matters to you that much that you can't stop thinking about it, it's going to be yours. I, I don't know why, but it's just kind of the world uh, works that way. I was talking to a few of my friends uh, uh, that I was uh, with them, and we started talking about this whole thing in L.A. about, you know, uh, who's somebody that's going to go out there and make these changes and all this other stuff. And they said, oh, so, Pat, when you were in the Army, you know, you said you used to drink. I said, yeah, I used to drink a bottle of tequila every weekend before I went to the nightclub because I partied my tail off for three years. One day I woke up and I said, I just can't stand the smell of alcohol. I literally don't like the smell of alcohol. Now, my friend, you know, you go to his place. This bottle's $10,000. This bottle's $6,000. This is Louis the 13th, $3,500. This bottle's $4,500. McAllen, all these other things. I'm like, honestly, it doesn't do anything to me because I don't like alcohol. It doesn't make me feel good the next morning. Uh, I don't like the taste of it. Uh, I like, I'll have a beer with you, a half a bottle of beer with you to have a conversation. Maybe a good wine, if you know how to choose wine, I'll have a you know, sip of wine and enjoy it with you. But I just don't like it. I used to drink, 
Uh, I used to be a womanizer. I used to chase girls all the time, and that was my priority. It was Thursday night ladies night, Friday night was given, Saturday night was given, and Sunday night was the real legitimate crusaders who were the ones that are going, going to go out there and party on Sunday night. I was a four-day-a-week party guy. Mm-hmm. And so I was the guy that you would say, man, I don't know what it is, man. Every nightclub I go to, it's as if there are seven paths out there. He's at every single one of them. Like he, He's like everywhere. He's at the after hours. He's at this. He's at that. I was that guy. And one day I got up and I said, I'm not having sex for 17 months until uh, I'm not having sex until I make my first million. And I didn't have sex for 17 months. And for me, I had to cut that out. For somebody else, it could be video games. For somebody else, it could be a show. For somebody else, it could be a, you know, a, a, a certain bowling or tennis or baseball league or a certain league they're part of that sucks them in for 30 hours a week that takes that time away from learning another skill set or another industry. But you generally, if something matters to you that you want to do, you have to cut a lot of things out for you to do that. And your question of, Pat, what does somebody need to do to get to that point? If they can finally, if they can fully get clear on what they want and it matters to them that much, nothing's going to happen. They'll just be on cruise control the rest of their lives. Okay. What habits um, do you do you feel like, imagine if I was to take out one habit out of your life, which, which habit do you think would have the biggest impact in regards to your performance throughout the day? What a great question, man. Phenomenal question, by the way. I would tell you, if you if you took reading away from me, I'm a regular guy right now, making, you know, regular place I'm working, I'm not doing anything significant. If you if you took all the books I've read in my life and you took that away from me, you wouldn't know who I am right now. You and I would have never met. Wow. And what what uh, which books would you say has have the greatest impact on you? I don't think it's one or two. I mean, obviously, you know, the givens, it's the ones that we've all heard of, you know, the Think and Grow Rich and How to Win Friends and Influence People, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. But if I get a little bit more specific, it would be First Rate Madness that talks about personality disorders and, you know, how John F. Kennedy had certain personality issues and Andrew Jackson or Alexander Hamilton, who was a very weird guy and him and George Washington fought all the time. Uh, another book named Hypomanic Edge that did a lot uh, for me. Another book called 101 Questions to Ask Before You Get Engaged or Laws of Success um, or Power Versus Force um, or Atlas Shrugged or, you know, uh, on the complete opposite and Communist Manifesto. Because for me, I always read opposing beliefs. I don't just read what one belief is. I think a lot of times people only listen to Democrats because they're Democrats. Or Republicans only listen to Republicans because they're Republicans. No, I want I watch Republican. I'll go to CNN and CNN is a, a, a liberals and I'll go to Fox and I watch Fox because I want to know both sides. I, if you took those books away from me. I, I, I mean, I I'd just be a regular guy. I'd be a guy watching sports every day and that would be my life. By the way, I have a top 100 book list on my website, PatrickBedeby.com that highlights the top 100 books to read for entrepreneurs and the top 100 movies to watch for entrepreneurs. And I explain why on the movie site on my website, patrickbedevy.com. Okay, cool. When you're reading these books, let's say, what, what, what is the motivation that, that you, you have to finish them or even pick the book up? What, what is it that you want? Purely curiosity, man. I, I think it's curiosity, you know, for you to start success insider.tv and, you know, you being a nutritional guy in the past and, you know, digital marketing and you doing seven figures, you're saying based on uh, what you told me on nutrition side and then wanting to do this success inside. What is it about? You're curious, mm-hmm. right? There's a certain level of curiosity. If you're missing curiosity, I mean, what a waste of a life because there's so many great things to learn about life. You know, there's so many things that we can be curious about and learn and how can I hack this and do it better and how can I hack that and do this better and what does this guy do that works for him? And what does that guy do that works for her? You know, I've been in so many different meetings or books I read that I learned one thing and I came back and it drastically changed my life. When I tell you drastically changed my life, it drastically changed my life. One book I read, I'll give you an idea. Nowadays, you know, we have these things everywhere, right? These are phones. Mm. Okay. You have Twitter, Snap, Insta, Facebook, YouTube, uh, WhatsApp, text, email, you got all these things. And everybody's on this mode to get an audience. How fast, 
How fast can I get an audience? How fast can I get an audience? How fast can I get an audience? We didn't have this 15 years ago. So what does that cause? Well, anxiety level is the highest it's ever been. It's just a reality. Panic attacks is the highest it's ever been. Uh, people are anxious. And so I'm, I'm in that world myself. So I'm sitting there one day, I have a massive anxiety attack that leads to a panic attack. I think I'm having a heart attack. My wife calls me, the uh, calls 911, it's two o'clock in the morning. Ambulance comes, my body's shaking on the ground. I go to the hospital and the doctor says, you're fine, you're not having a heart attack. I said, then what is it? He said, tell me about what you've been doing. I said, I've been on the road for the last three weeks. So how much sleep are you getting every night? I said, about four hours per night. He says, it's, you know, exhaustion. You know, your body has reached a limit and it's telling you, you're working too hard. And then what else? I said, well, my wife's pregnant. We just had a kid and we weren't expecting the second one. We can't really have a second kid. I just started a company. I'm going through uh, issues right now with the company because I just lost a carrier. And we started off with 66 agents. Our insurance company today, now we're at 5,200 agents. We've had 11 quarters and our top line revenue has grown. But at that time, scariest time at that time with the business. So I'm having anxiety attacks every day. So I go out there and I say, my gosh, what is this all about? So I start reading all about anxiety and panic attacks and depression. I'm like, I got to figure these things out. And a simple statement was made in a book. I read a book that was 400 pages. I didn't pick up that much. I read a book that was 68 pages. And this author, she says, every time you're having an anxiety attack or you're having depression, just think about the pendulum. Whenever it's anxiety, you're living in the future. Whenever it's depression, you're living in the past. In that moment, if you can figure out a way to bring yourself here, you have sanity. Look what a subtle thing that is. Now, what if I don't know that? What if I wasn't curious to figure that part out? I'm going to be dealing with this for a long time to come. That little hack allowed me to control what I'm doing in that moment. So what if someone's not curious to figure out those things? It's out there. The information is out there. The formula is out there. Uh, once you figure it out, you have an edge over everybody else. So to answer your question for you, I would say curiosity is the kicker. And why do you think some cu people are just curious about, I don't know, some BS out there in regards to, some people be c really curious about some show on Netflix, right? What, what is it that makes a high performer such as yourself be curious about education and constantly growing in that sense? I mean, it's, it's your audience, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's who you're with. I mean, I watch Jerry Springer at a time where all my friends watch Jerry Springer. You know, I watch Jay Leno and everybody else watch Jay Leno. Uh, I have people here at the office that they talk about uh, Pablo Escobar's show Narcos. You know, hey, did you see what Narcos did? I watched it. Uh, you know, I have House of Cards. Did you see? Oh, my gosh. They said that was like Clinton's family or that was the Bush family or that was the Kennedy family. Isn't that crazy that they're saying it's 99 percent accurate? Oh, I got to go watch it. I, mean, oh, I got to go watch it. I got to go watch it. And I, I'm on episode number 17. I'm on, you know, and then you're stuck with it, right? <laughs> So if you're in an amount, now imagine we do the complete opposite thing. Imagine me, you, and three other guys, mm -hmm. and we're working, and you say, dude, you know what? I just found that. What's that? Do you know that Amazon uses this one software that they bought from this guy, that the software did this, 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 this to their company, and I bought the software just last month. It took our sales up 28%. And I watch this video that's an hour and a half video interview with Bezos. I'm like, which video? Send me the link. And oh my gosh, hey, do you know I also watched that video? And then there was another video that this guy did that he said this, and I bought this software, and we've been using this. Dude, this thing is sick. Let me send it to you. Look what we're doing now. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So we all have this gift of curiosity. It's a gift that's given to us. What we get curious about. I mean, I got people that get curious about pornography. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and, and you know that nowadays that's a you know, I watched this one thing and then it led to this thing and then it led to, and then I noticed this and you get that whole level of curiosity for wasted things you can do in your life is everywhere. Uh, I think it's simply just channeling. If you can figure out a way to channel it into another area, you, you'll have a major shift in your life. So do you believe it is important to hang around with people who are, let's say, winners if you want to become a winner? Of course, most definitely. There's... There's so, so, okay. So I went through, there's five stages you go through in, in, in business, right? So mm -hmm. you first become an employee, you work for somebody. After you become an employee, you learn sales. So you learn how to become independent. After you learn sales, maybe you learn how to become a sales manager and you know how to manage a handful of people or 100 people or 20 people. After that, you become a business owner and you learn how to have an office, 
assistance, operation, technology, software, then you learn how to become a CEO. CEO is the last thing you learn how to do. And most people don't know what it is to do. Because some people ask, I don't even know what it is to be a CEO. What am I supposed to do today? Am I supposed to act important and say important things? What do I do as a CEO? I'm confused, right? Mm. So, you know, your question when you say, you know, is it important on um, uh, association and all that other stuff? My first seven and a half years, I thought I could do everything by myself to grow the company. And I was working 100 hours a week. And as a, I was running a, uh, a sales office, I was a sales manager and I, and I became a business owner. And I was running an office by myself. I was working you know, 100 hours, I'm coming in early, leaving late seven days a week. I'm doing everything in my power. And I haven't had exponential growth. And then one day I realized, look, if in the NBA, all these players talk about the 1992 dream team, I'm going to put a dream team together. So I decided I'm going to go recruit some of the best talent in the marketplace and the best brains. I went and found a guy named Tom Ellsworth. Tom Ellsworth sold uh, Jam Dad to EA Sports. You're familiar with EA Sports, you know, yeah. the whole video game company. He sold this company for $680 million is what he did. He sold this company for $680 million. And I sat down with this guy and I talked to him. He was known in Silicon Valley when Bill Gates and, and Warren Buffett, you know, Bill Gates and Steve Jobs did that last interview. You know, it's on YouTube. It's Red Shares. Mm -hmm. 300 people were invited. Tom was one of them. Tom mm -hmm. is now the president of uh, uh, my company here. I hired him. He's been with me full time for two and a half years. And Tom's the president. Local here in Dallas, you'll see Beal Bank everywhere. Beal Bank is ran by a guy named Andy Beal. Andy Beal is the second richest man in Texas. He's worth $15 billion. Andy Beal, I was looking for a CFO. So I'm like, we got to get somebody that's a killer CFO. So we start searching for CFOs. I meet this guy named Ian. I had 40 candidates. It came to 12 and finally six that I interviewed with. Tom filtered to 40 and the 40 led to 12 and then the six was me meeting with them for six hours straight, six candidates, I meet Ian. I like Ian, I had Ian. Ian was a CEO for Beal Bank uh, for one of his companies that they had $5 billion of debt mortgage that they bought. And then he was a CFO of another company recently that they do uh, um, um, D-Paper. They do subprime auto financing. They took it from zero to 400 million. He's now my CFO. I found uh, Amur Nubarans, you know, financial industry. We have a lot of compliance issues. He was my compliance guy back in 02. He was the best of the best. I went and got him. Now, these guys cost. They cost money because you got to give them salary and you got to give them equity. So mm -hmm. they're not coming here just for salary. You know, they're not just going to come and say, pay me a nice salary and I'm going to be fired up. They're coming here to get a salary and they want a piece of the company. So what does this mean? Oh, well, I don't want to give up any equity. Yeah, but the company, you know, goes higher in value, do I have a problem? No, so I learned, I learned, you don't have to know everything. You just have to have the people around you that know everything about those five topics that you know nothing about. And so if you can have those people around you and you got five people that know everything about five topics, that means you have access to knowing everything about 25 topics. Now you have an edge, right? So that idea of having those people around you, you hear it a lot in like motivational, you know, the keys association, all this other stuff. But that goes a lot deeper. I mean, you can we can talk on this topic for three days and it can go deeper into your marriage, into parenting, into your health, into so many of your own investments, your finances. Uh, but yeah, association is very, very critical. OK, um, what have you learned in regards to, let's say, one, one common pattern you've seen amongst these uh, incredibly successful people you spend time with? I saw that you was interviewed on some uh, networks I was following recently, actually. What, what have you noticed in regards to these, uh, let's say, financially successful people? What's the common belief that they all share amongst each other? They're fanatical. They're, they're fanatical. They're very obsessive. Um, they have a very high level obsession. Um, they're, 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 they're fanatical to the point that if you found out some of the ways they worked and the hours they put in, you wouldn't want to do what they did. They're different. They, they didn't just become millionaires because they're smart. A lot of times the credit is given because of how out, uh, uh, outrageously brilliant they are. I know a lot of broke, brilliant people. A lot. I know a lot of broke, broke, super smart people who are extremely information, you know, they 
photographic memory. You know these guys that read a book and they can remember all the quotes? I know people that read a book. He can tell me the exact quote on what page. I'm like, why are you 52 years old and you've never made more than a quarter million dollars in a year? How's that even possible? Well, because he's lazy. So, you know, the, the, the people that make a lot of money, let me tell you, they are fanatical about their work ethic. You know, they go on vacations. They don't know how to go on vacation because they, they don't, they can't sit still. But to some people, they'd be like, well, that's not a healthy. And, you know, I read an article on Huffington Post that said it's good to sleep your way to the top and sleep nine hours a day. And so because of that, I don't think these people are healthy people. I'm sorry, but you're using a phone of a guy that's fanatical. His name is Steve Jobs. OK, you're using a computer of a guy that was fanatical. His name is Michael Dell. You know, you're using a car by a guy that's fanatical. His name is Elon Musk. What do you, what do you want me to tell you? You just bought a $300,000 Ferrari that is by a car who was fanatical. His name is Enzo. You want to keep going? So let's take all these <laughs> fanatical, obsessive people out. We're screwed, right? Mm. So, you know, in the insurance world today, we're doing something in the insurance world that's never been done before. Some people, uh, I have a lot of enemies. There's a lot of people that can't stand me. There's a lot of people in the marketplace that within my industry, the life insurance industry, it employs 5.7 million people in America. It's a very big industry. But you know, people are looking and saying, wait a minute, first of all, you don't look like an insurance guy. You're from Iran. Most insurance guy in America today are 59 year old white male. You're from Iran. You're a 31 year old CEO at the time when we got started. Your company, they're 51 percent Hispanic. You know, you got uh, Hispanic female insurance agents, which makes zero sense. What are you guys doing? You guys are so weird. We don't you know, you're, you're doing all the social media. Can you just stop already? You know, we're, we're fanatical. We're obsessive. Um, but that is that is a very common thread amongst the people you see who have made a lot of money. What do you think is the biggest difference between somebody who's, let's say, um, working hard and working smart? Because that's something that's always chucked around online. What would you say is bigger, the biggest difference? I, I can tell you one thing. One hundred percent. If you don't work hard, you ain't even going into the game. Uh, that's the barrier to enter. You know, th think about it this way. Are you, are you a sports guy? You, you, you like sports? I, I like playing sports. I didn't watch sports. <laughs> okay. So if, if you look at the sports side, right? I mean, how many people are super talented you met that never made it to the next level? A lot of them, right? Yeah. Talent alone is not going to do it for you. you got to work hard. But also at the same time, how many people you know that work their asses off and they didn't make it to the next level? A lot, a lot of them, <laughs> right? So, so neither one is alone right, if that makes sense. So mm. these people say, you know, you, if you don't work hard, you are not. You, you got to work hard to become a millionaire. That's not enough. You know, you don't have to work hard. All the people I know that are super rich, they don't work that hard. Okay. So I'm going to try to break it down in a way that this makes sense. So the guy that says all the billionaires I know and the DECA millionaires I know, they don't work that hard. Yes, that's like saying a grandfather is more relaxed with his grandkids than it is with, the, with his own kids. It's, it's an unfair statement, mm. right? Because a grandfather, he's gonna spend time with, your, with his grandkids for two hours, and then he's gonna give it back to the parent. The parent has to spend 166 hours a week, you know, with that kid. The parent has to do the diapers and all this. Stuff. Grandfather's like, here you go, right? So the millionaire, the billionaire, he no longer has to work as hard as maybe he did when he was coming up because he's now leveraging his time because he's got the resources. But the first come up, I mean, look, you're going to have a lot of nights of sleeping at the office. You know, you're going to have a lot of nights where you fall asleep on your couch. You know, we had a couch in our sales office that at least 50 people had slept on that couch. At least, not together, hopefully not together. <laughs> Sometimes I have stories where people said, you know, things happen on that couch that you don't know about, so we would always have to finish the couch every week. But, you know, you're, you're going to have those nights. On the other side, if you don't constantly figure out a way to come up with a new strategy and take your game to a whole different level, all the hard, hard work in the world is going to do nothing for you. Both are needed. Okay. Uh, before we start wrapping up, Patrick, um, I'm sure some of your uh, followers uh, who actually follow your channel, Value Tamer, right now, they're probably wondering what's happened to you because <laughs> you, you published a video two months ago or something saying you're shutting down or something. So what, what's the plan in regards to that or do you want to leave that confidential? 
Yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll see what's going to happen, right? But by Tim, and I can tell you right now, um, when that happened two months ago, October. So we raised the money from Oscar De La Hoya, Gabriel Brenner, and Adelaide Group in August. And then all of a sudden, the business went, boom, it started growing. And I'm a guy that I'm a schedule guy. And for three years on Valuetainment, we never missed a single schedule. Meaning, if I said I'm going to do an episode every Tuesday and every Thursday, we did an episode every Tuesday and every Thursday for two and a half years. Never missed a beat. And it was always on time. So the moment I realized we may be getting to a point that we may not hit the schedule, I said, we can't be doing anything. So I don't like winging anything. I don't like to just kind of say, oh, we'll do a video one time on Saturday afternoon, four o'clock. And we'll do a video one time Monday evening, seven o'clock. I, 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 you know, if I'm running it, I want to run it solid. So if we, you know, we got all these value around the world that are, uh, um, you know, I'm not going to lie to you. I mean, it is, I feel like, um, how do I explain it to you? I feel like um, a part of me is missing. The fact that we're not creating any new content. I miss all the value I miss all the dialogues. I miss all the fans out there. I miss, I miss everything that we were doing with it. So there's a part of me that every day wants to come back and create content. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, yeah, so that's why we made the decision of stepping away from value and taking a break uh, and focusing on the business that was growing. Okay, so there's a slight chance it may be back, right? Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> it's all on uh, uh, timing, when, how, okay. schedule, team, support. It has to make sense. If I come back this next time around, we're not just coming back to play, we're coming back to play very big. And when we come back this next time around, so it has to make sense for a bigger play when we do come back. Brilliant. Um, I recently read a stat from University of Scranton, which showed around 8% of people will actually achieve their New Year's resolution. And with 2018 around the corner and people around this time, they're planning their goals. What, what one piece of advice would you leave all of insiders tuning right now that can really help them to win in comparison to most people who will fail? I mean, listen, why don't we start off with a sacrifice? If you're really serious, don't party on the first. You know, don't go do anything on the 31st. Uh, don't go out drinking with everybody. If you're really that committed, why don't you celebrate the 31st at your house with your friends, reading, studying, and writing your business goals down and putting the strategy together and let everybody go out. What are you celebrating for? It's not like you made millions. It's just a new year. Mm-hmm. You know, every day is a new day. We don't go out there celebrating every day. You know, so this is a very good commercialized celebration, which the world needs uh, to give everybody a way of saying it's a new year to do this. Um, I, I, I think if a person's really serious about creating all these resolutions and you said 8%, which sounds pretty accurate, is why don't you start now? You know, why don't you start the pain threshold early? Um, I used to have a pain pleasure uh, r- reward recognition system I would do for myself. I would say, okay, if you do this this week, you get to go home Saturday night at 6 o'clock. If you don't, you're not only working Saturday, but you're also working Sunday. And so I wouldn't hit it. Then I'm at the office Saturday night till nine o'clock and I'm at the office Sunday in the afternoon for six hours if I didn't hit it. If I did hit it, such and such. Okay, in the next 90 days, if you go out there and do X, Y, Z, you're gonna be able to buy this. By the end of the year, if you have this much savings, you're gonna go buy yourself a Harley or an S600 or an Escalator. You're gonna go to New York, New Year's Eve, and you're gonna go $5,000 shopping at Saxville. I put those types of things in place. So that's the part that's emotional, mental mindset. Let me give you a little bit more logical side of thinking. I I wouldn't suggest people create just New Year resolutions. I think creating a 30-day resolution on the first is more important than the annual. And to create a 90-day resolution is also more important than the annual. So meaning, let's just say 12 months, I'm going to make a quarter million dollars this year, okay? I want to lose 40 pounds this year, whatever the number is that you have. Forget the year. What are you going to do in January? How much are you going to lose in January? Okay. How much are you going to, if, you're, if your formula is, I got to make XYZ amount of calls and run this many appointments and I make this kind of money, great. How much activity are you going to do in January? Not the year. If you just break the piece down for the year, you're not going to hit it. So break it down into three months and do it quarterly, just like CEOs do. Uh, and where are you going to be by March 31st, Q1? 
Uh, and where are you going to be, you know, June 30th, Q2, July 1st? And then uh, 30 days, where are you going to be by the end of January 31st? What's that number? And then within the monthly, break it down into weekly. Unfortunately, this is to some people, they're like, oh, my gosh, this is already overwhelming. Um, but those 8% of people that generally keep their resolutions, it matters to them. Again, it goes back to the same conversation. It matters to them. If it matters to them, they're going to get it done for anybody. That's the 8 percenters. The 92 percenters, it didn't really matter to them. They're just doing what everybody else is doing. Let's write something down and hopefully we hit it. Amazing. Patrick, just want to say thank you so much for providing so much value to our community today. Really appreciate it. Brother, appreciate you for having me. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. And Insider, thank you so much for checking out uh, this interview with Patrick Bed david today. Um, where would you like them to go check out more of your work, Patrick? Uh, you go on YouTube and you type in the word Valuetainment or Patrick Bed david or Entrepreneur. You'll see us all over the place. Okay. Subscribe there and you'll see the videos. And if you want to message me, I'm on Instagram. I respond back to all the messages. Brilliant. So Insider, thanks once again. And as always, my friend, follow your heart and take action and go live the life you want to live. See you on the next episode soon.